This time on the show, hunting for something versus creating from scratch. There is always something you want people to focus on. And let's use the one without the hairy arm in the corner. All this and more on Comics Are Great. It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live at the Ann Arbor District Library, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, uh, visual storytelling, the lifestyle of being a creative person, all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today for the 2015 schedule kickoff is a, a buddy of mine. We're buddies, aren't we? Yeah. We, we go bowling together. Bowling so. team, yeah. <laughs> You're the captain. <laughs> that still cracks me up every time we talk about it. Uh, it's a Peter Baker. Pete right. Baker. PeterBaker.net. Photographer. Designer. Um, NASA enthusiast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Disappointed NASA enthusiast. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. But, <laughs> but uh, okay, so designer. Like, when, like, photographer, we know generally what that means. Like, you hold up a camera, you point at that thing, you take a picture of the thing. We'll talk in detail about, yeah. like, what all what really goes into that. But when, you, when you're designer, what does that mean? Like, oh, you do some stuff in Adobe Illustrator or what? Um, I mean, it, it can be a, a huge range of things. It, it's everything from, from writing um, to visual sort of narrative and layout to branding, um, incorporating photography, incorporating text. Really, it's it's communication, mm-hmm. visual communication. So, like, yeah, like, so uh, we've actually worked together on some projects yeah. where we were actually creating characters for branding, but then you also can do, like, like just, like, general branding of, like, creating, like, a visual style to communicate, like, a feeling or essence of a thing. Yeah, so, you know, everything from advertising design where you're going to, you know, primarily be selling something to, you know, there there are numerous commercial artists who are also, um, you know, illustrators and, and fine art, you know, print sellers and, and things like that. So runs the gamut. And when we say you're a photographer, let's 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 establish your cred here. You got some cred. <laughs> this is pretty good. Uh, you worked for Bloomberg Business Week. Mm-hmm. Worked for Country Living, Popular Mechanics. That's pretty mm-hmm. cool. National Geographic Traveler, uh, ESPN Magazine, and a whole bunch of other things. That's all you can find out your whole uh, CV on PeterBaker.net, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, before we dive into the comparative thing between <laughs> photography and comics, yeah. because we get we what inspired me actually for this discussion was we were at uh, a local Ann Arbor like. Uh, do-gooder event <laughs> and we were like posting like it was like the sun conference thing where we're posting like potential uh talks or discussions and like i want i wrote comics on the yeah. wall and you wrote photography and then we turned to this whole thing <laughs> of, like well nobody wants to do a photography one because all that is is like just pointing a magic box at a thing and t- snapping a picture and you're like whatever you could draw whatever you want you, you don't have to deal with the con- <laughs> confines of reality it's like that's a discussion but um we can talk about the NASA thing a little bit because I'm a bit of a NASA nerd too. I've yep. uh, been to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum several times. Went even went to the annex on purpose, you know, and you know geeking out over uh, John Young's comb. <laughs> 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 Did you see that? Like they had like his toothpaste and stuff. Like wow, that's a yep. toothpaste. Yep. Um, so you know, I'm at, can we pull up the photos uh, that that you can find on Pete's site uh, with the. Uh, your trip to Florida. Yeah. So a little background on, on it. This was um, one of the last uh, shuttle launches. This was the um, Endeavor. Or Columbia was second to last. Um, and a buddy of mine, Justin Ouellette, who's a really, really great photographer in New York, both space nuts, um, neither of us had ever been to a launch. So we're like, this, this is the time to go. Let's not even try to go to the very last one because that's you know, it's just going to be impossible. Let's go to the second last one, turn it into a whole thing. Part of what really interested us um, about it was not just the space program, but the the sort of community that had been built around the space program. You know, the, the area of Florida that Cape Canaveral is in is called the Space Coast. Like banks and uh, credit unions and grocery stores, they're Space Coast Credit Union. Like they, <laughs> they, have, they have taken this on and it's really like – Part of their personality and their uh, the persona of the area, yeah. the the high school is astronaut high school. I mean, it's just crazy, it's pervasive. It's yeah. throughout, and so we were really interested in like what is what is that going to mean when you basically take the identity of a, a entire area that's been you know going since the the right stuff, 
and you know take it out of there like and so abruptly too right right Right? right. this isn't like 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 what happened in detroit with the auto manufacturing like where it was a very gradual thing it maybe didn't feel gradual the people were experiencing it but like this is like oh guess what tomorrow by the way it's scrap now yeah there's no more yeah (laughs) yeah and i mean to be fair there is there is still um you know stuff going on there they are still doing commercial launches for satellites and stuff but it's just not the same as the shuttle program you know the shuttle program was the iconic space um, per, uh, space element of my childhood of of a lot of people's and for a long time for dude. a long time thirty years. I of, mean, like yeah, Project Gemini was what a year, right? Uh, yeah, the the whole Apollo program ran you know for less than twenty years. Yeah, and the space shuttle. I mean, this was an icon. Like, and in the Apollo program, you know, the rockets changed. Like, every there was no single sort of silhouette. the the nat, The shuttle program had the same space plane, basically. For thirty years, and I mean, it was incorporated into movies. Um, every everything from, from uh, Space Camp to I don't even know what else. even Transformers. Used well, like we were just talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we were just talking about like there's two Transformers who were space shuttles. Yeah. There was a GoBot named Spacey who was a Transformer right. or who was a space shuttle. Right? There was a space shuttle something for everything. Yeah, there was a right. version of the space shuttle for every iconic you know childhood toy growing up so i mean it really was a hugely inspirational thing for so many people and then all of a sudden they're just like nah <laughs> not anymore and you know i get it there's whether or not the the program yeah. itself made sense anymore yeah it's just i mean it was like huge gut check so many people just and and especially around cape canaveral and titusville so um, was that palpable when you were down there oh it was it was yeah it was Dank with dreariness. I mean, it was just sad. Like oh. it was, it it was really similar to. I mean, it it was very similar to Detroit, and and the way you could just feel that you know the the air sucked out of the room. Oof. Um, and you know, not that not that things in Titusville have been you know great great recently, but... all, all the way because the pro the program's been dwindling for years. Mm. But it was still just you know given up because the all the now all of a sudden like overnight all the places that had you know shuttle themes to it were now a bygone era like right. they were they were immediately in the past so right all the even like there were comic book shops there were bars all these things that were named astronauts or shuttle something immediately they're like oh that's that old thing yeah you yeah, know, yeah. It's just, that, that's what i noticed when i was looking at your photography that you uh, the pictures you took is that there's all of these like really corny like astronaut statues outside yeah. of stores and like a space shuttle in the marquee yep. and when i looked at it, it it had like it instantly carried this sadness to it like the way when you see like an abandoned merry-go-round right yeah. Like, yeah, like that exactly. kind of like, like exactly the, this was once a joyous campy thing like it, in in when it's when it's alive it maybe can be, but it feels like there's a spirit of joy around it. But right. when it's abandoned, it just looks really, really sad and yeah. broken. And it and it was, I mean, it was a tourist draw. Like it was yeah. a major tourist draw. So even places that had nothing to do with it, there was a jewelry shop that had an astronaut <laughs> statue standing outside with a bunch of chains hanging over it. It was like, <laughs> it was like everyone is co-opting this for for their own uses, which oh which everybody does around Disney World or anything else too. Yeah, yeah. And it was Florida. Like they know tourism, so yeah. That was their thing, but it, but it just when it was a science-based, space-based uh, government program that was the tourism draw. There's something really special about that yeah. when it's not, you know, Mickey Mouse or Cedar Point or something. It was a, it was an inspiring tourism draw that is just gone. So the reason I bring this up, and I'm so glad you spoke to it so well, Pete, because this is you just like sort of uh, did a, in microcosm like this whole demonstration of what a visual storyteller does. You identified the, the symbolism, you d- identified the iconography, and then you made the connections to the, 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 the context and the surroundings and the environment and pulled together a narrative out of this whole thing. And you can find all the photos on the website, uh, Peter Baker, peterbaker.net. Yep. And also you did an Ignite talk on this. Yeah, so, so the, the second part of the story is we go down there <laughs> for, this whole, for a whole week, you know, shooting around, like talking to people, just getting pictures of the things. There's, you know, there's all these people sort of coming out of the word works, people who had worked in the space program for years before. Um, and they're all, they're all coming around to see this thing. And so Justin and I, um, the, the morning of the launch, we get up ungodly early, uh, hike out to this causeway, which is the, the best place you can see without credentials. 
Mm-hmm. Best place to see it from. We had rented this ridiculous camera lens, this 800 millimeter camera lens that you know we were as close as we were ever going to get. We were perfect situation. Two hours from launch, all of a sudden we hear over this bullhorn. But before before we hear it from the bullhorn, we hear all these people going, "Oh, <laughs> we're like what? What? What's going on?" And they they had scrubbed the launch for some really obscure mechanical thing. And right. you're like, "All right, well maybe you know let's just keep an eye on. It. Maybe it'll go up later." And like, but you know. With a space shuttle launch, if there's some mechanical thing, they're not they're not doing it. If it was a window or a weather window kind of thing, right. so we stuck thing. around for a couple more days, and it just got less and less likely. And then they were finally like, "We don't even know when this is gonna go." And yeah. so, I was um, we we both came back. My my wife was actually a month shy of uh, nine months pregnant, so. I couldn't really stay in Florida on this, you know, Don Quixote quest of seeing a space shuttle launch. So we were like, well, maybe maybe we'll make it to the last one. Maybe we will go to um, Discovery. And we come back. Um, I I saw the final space shuttle launch from the doctor's office <laughs> during my wife's labor. So oh, wow. Yeah, so it was, it was worth it. Yeah. But still one of those brutal... <laughs> Brutal realizations. That you I'm you want see that. you go through all that. You want that exclamation point on yes. the end, right? Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, it actually made for a fairly um, perfect, sort of poignant, you know, end chapter to the whole thing. The whole thing was disappointing. <laughs> you know, the, the, I mean, we were bummed if it did go off. We were bummed. It, we were, you know, <laughs> depressed if it didn't. So, like the whole thing, like leaving, there was nothing happy about the whole situation. Seeing that go off would have been like. Oh great! We got that last <laughs> photo finally, but you know right. the other ninety nine percent of it was really about the rest of the you know disappointing Florida stuff, and so I suppose it's you know serendipitous that we never got that. <laughs> so so that's why my my uh, ignite talk was Florida space and disappointment. <laughs> those three things now are all tied together. Fine. But you set up fireworks. We did on the yeah, beach. <laughs> yeah, the closest we got was was a big rocket. You can get big rockets in Florida. Uh, so we got a big fireworks rocket and shot it off on the beach. <laughs> oh, was... uh, but that's great. I mean, it's just it's like so. The, you're a guy who thinks a lot about visual storytelling, and and I'm wondering if we could I, I, maybe just want to throw out this whole like argument about like photography versus comics because uh, that I was think just, that was just to get people to watch. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's 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 how the car dealers get you to come in. <laughs> Only one ninety nine a month. Yeah, uh, but like. Because I was also looking at your website, and I, I noticed that you have things set up to where um, all your galleries scroll horizontally, mm-hmm. and the galleries are arranged by like uh, sort of like subject groupings. So like you have like the NASA story, yeah. in a grouping on there. And so I'm scrolling through. I'm like, he's telling a story. This is comics. He's yeah. telling the story. It wasn't just like here's the photos in the order I took right. them. Right. There's like highs and lows like in that gallery as I'm scrolling and scrolling and yeah. scrolling. Sequencing and editing is is a huge part of. Photography, especially you know, books, have become a really big deal in, in photography again. For a while, mm. um, you know, book publishing was sort of languishing. There, not a lot of people, not a lot of photographers were putting out photo books. Now everybody is uh, mm. self printed books, um, mainstream published books, and so sequencing and that and that sort of narrative um, is becoming or has become really important again. It's not just you know, it's sort of like covers versus the books. You know. You, Oh, I, I have plenty of photos that would only apply as a single, you know, standalone sort of cover. Yeah. But I, I really feel feel good when I'm able to develop something longer. So are you thinking about that when you're firing off your shots? Are you thinking about like, oh, I just shot this 10 minutes ago. This will go really well with that. Or is this a thing where you have to put all the photos on a table and look at them and figure out where the connections are? Sometimes both. Um, you know, if, if I had like... Obviously, Florida, uh, some of the other stuff, I'll, I'll have an idea in, in mind first, and I seek out certain things and try to try to link photos you know, through some element from what I was shooting, find some thread through other things I'm shooting and kind of have something in mind as I'm going. But at the same time, I also just – I like producing single single images that look – you know, look really interesting and dynamic too. So. All right, can we dive into squishy questions then? I'll yeah, like zigzag all over the place because, like, this is one of the things. Like, you know, I mean, uh, I I do this I do this exercise with my students uh, where because like one of the things about comics that makes it very daunting is it's an advantage and a disadvantage in that I can if I want to show a three quarter down shot into a room I can lift the ceiling right off of the mm-hmm. place and I can show a really 
mathematically unrealistic interpretation of that room in order to be able to stage all my elements and everything. Yeah. But it still means that I got to map out three point perspective. I got to draw whatever kind of like, oh, there's a Danish modern coffee table in there. Crap, I got to draw that, right? And like, they got this kind of sofa and that kind of sofa. Um, so a lot of my students, like when they're approaching visual storytelling, they'll be very daunted by the fact that they have to like draw all this stuff right. before they've even thought about what their shots are going to be. So I send them off on a walk. I'm like, go for a walk. Take a digital camera. Take a phone camera. It doesn't matter. And go for a walk in your favorite place where you just feel at ease and relaxed. And whenever something makes you say, ah, don't overthink it. Just grab a picture of it. And they come back and we look at all their photos. And like I, as the instructor, try to go like, okay, well, here's what I'm noticing that yeah. you're doing. Maybe you can take that to your comics. Like you're doing a lot of really extreme close-up stuff. You're really interested in texture and shadow and structures. Okay, so we'll apply that. You are really interested in depth and staging. and put, So put that in. So, um... But the thing is, that in that lesson, I, I'm telling them whenever something makes you go, ah, grab that photo. Uh -huh. So I'm curious if you've ever tried to reverse engineer or if it's even dawned on you, like when you're saying, ah, the thing, like I'm arrested, I need to grab this. Like what makes, what's going on in your head and what's going on around you when you say, this is the shot that I need to take? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish I could say I, I think it through that much as sure. I'm doing it. Um, you know, the the thing I love about uh, photography is is the exploratory nature of it. It's like mm -hmm. I, you know, to some extent, only identify a shot once I see it. You know, it's yeah. like I'm I'm not a studio photographer. I'm not creating sets. I'm not crafting an image. I'm looking for it. You know, I'm I'm more hunting for something versus uh, creating it. Uh, from scratch, you know that. That said, I I know usually what I'm looking for, even if I haven't thought it through from a, a compositional angle or something or something like that. I I know the kind of things that I'm most interested in. I know where to find them or or where where maybe I should start at. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's it's a it's definitely different. I mean, you know, going going back to the photographers versus comic artist for a minute it's yeah. it's you know i'm i'm jealous in a way for the ability to create whatever it is the tearing the roof off that's a perfect example you know mm -hmm. that's that's simply not a photograph you're gonna be able to take right you can create it you know there, yeah. there's actually uh, a couple of great photographers who do whole room shots from above hmm. and they do it through like assembling a ton of photos into it, and it basically becomes illustrative at that point. Wow. They, they're just capturing the elements and then they illustrate it. And it's amazing the way they're able to match the perspective and stuff like that. I don't, I don't do that. And I think a lot of, a lot of that, um, comes from, you know, having shot film for so long and I, I simply couldn't afford to shoot tons and tons of photos. So I almost edited before shooting, you know, mm -hmm. now, now it's really, it, it's amazing to be able to shoot 500 photos in an afternoon. So you are shooting digitally now? Prim yeah, quite a bit yeah. uh, more. I still, once in a while, I'll go out on, on a very specific you know project that I just feel like it would be worth shooting large format film or something. I'll do that, but really it's it's become almost almost all digital for me. And, well, the, the technology's probably caught up, I would imagine, at this point. Uh, yes and no. I mean, yeah. they're up to a certain uh, certain sensor size. You know, if yeah. you get into medium format digital, it's very close to medium format film. Nothing matches large format film. Four, four inches by five inches, eight inches by ten inches. I brought a Alex Soth book. He shoots almost nothing but eight by ten film. They're the the fidelity, the the richness of them, the the color depth is you know, it's it's still still, un, still unmatched. Okay, but I'm not shooting that stuff. So. <laughs> The benefits, you know, uh, of digital being able to shoot so many and then being able to tease out the thread between them uh, is really helpful. Let me dig at this hunting thing you talk about. So, like, you're hunting for something rather than creating from scratch. Is this hunting thing? Is it always a joyous activity, or are there times where it's like, crap, I'm not, I'm not getting anything today. Like, nothing is like coming through this lens that makes any sense to me. Oh, that I mean, that happens all the time. <laughs> okay, um, you know, I'm I'm totally bummed out about. <laughs> uh, something about photos I shoot constantly, but I usually don't notice that until later. So, mm. so in the act of doing it, I'm having a great time wandering around somewhere I'm not supposed to be, yeah. or just you know outside bumming around. You're doing all those something. Detroit photos. You got a lot of photos of Detroit, yeah, and you post a lot in your Instagram. People should follow you on Instagram as Peter Baker on Instagram. Yeah. Um, 
so you're not you're like just like just... oh yeah that's that, i yep just wandering <laughs> That's wandering awesome. Street, wandering the streets like a hobo, you know, <laughs> getting getting photos that pop up in front of me. But you know, Detroit's a tough case because you don't want to. You know, I'm trying not trying not to specifically mm-hmm. shoot. I'm not actually interested in the sort of ruin porn aspect of Detroit, but that is a major backdrop to everything else that happens in Detroit. And the the juxt really what I'm usually looking for in a place like Detroit is juxtaposition mm-hmm. between something. Um, Something old, something new, something natural, something um, man-made, something colorful, something drab. You know, those kind of contrasts in both subject and color or layout or anything like that. That's where I was picking was up really on interest. that. Yeah, I was digging through your your, uh, your your galleries, and I did notice that you have a lot of shots that are, like, where there seems to be a single point of focus on a subject, like a house on a hill, uh, a van in an underground parking garage, uh, or or the when some of your Iceland shots, there's like a, a van just out in like these like misty like nowhere, yeah. right? Uh, and and at first I was like, oh, he's really focusing on like loneliness or something. There's something about isolation that's really like important to him. But I was like, no way, it's about contrast. It's about the context of this thing in this environment. Everyone, because you never get, at least you rarely get really tight on the subject. It's mm-hmm. always like pulled back. Yeah. Straight horizon line thing, and then a whole bunch of stuff around that thing, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like that juxtaposition and that contrast and that that uh, what am I trying to say? Um, context. Yeah, and and a lot of that started when I was um, living in Chicago, and I was um, sort of getting into photography as just a artistic pursuit. I was working as a designer, but you know, I I went to school for photography, but I never really expected to have a you know, career in photography. The school I went to was primarily journalism and that you know i wasn't going to be a war zone photographer and, you know i was a little more boring than that so yeah. so i moved to chicago and i was working as a designer and and in chicago major metro area um uh, people everywhere so i was often like seeking out places where there just wasn't anybody mm. and that was sort of tough to find in chicago but when you did it was a really sort of special place and moment so there were a lot of places where and and frankly a, it it took a lot of trespassing to to <laughs> to find that in yeah. that place. But when you did, it was like this this amazing reprieve from the otherwise like chaos of a major city like that. And so a lot of that so, you know, loneliness is certainly an aspect that can be um ascribed to it, but but I really see it as, you know, isolation and, and sort of reprieve. And quietude. Yeah, uh, quietude. Yeah, I, I, that I have... was actually the name of just a a dummy book that I was putting together for a long time, Quietude, because oh, that's wow. how I saw it. Not not so much like the the sadness and dreariness, but really the calmness and the isolation and the solitude. Well, I have to wonder how much of that comes from your upbringing too, because you grew up in a pretty rural area yeah. when you were younger, yep. right? Like, and you know, I've been to that town, and it's just it's like, flat. It's flat. It's like Ohio flat, right? Yeah, yeah. and like I imagine it's even flat. It's Michigan flat. <laughs> Well, where we live here in Michigan, we've actually got like yeah, some right. some some geography, but sure. but yeah that, yeah no, I grew up in Central Michigan, and yeah. like and it was like in a town where like twenty five kids in my class, little yep. house in the prairie kind of deal, and at night it was silent. Oh yeah, yeah, and you saw everything in the sky. I got to see Halley's Comet in yeah. like a country sky. That was amazing. You know, uh, so like I, I, I had wondered like if that like contributes to that voice, right? It was like you go from that to a cacophonous place. Yeah, yeah, I think it, I think it definitely did. The horizon was it was the biggest uh, visual, you know, defining uh, element of every composition. You know, just from seeing it with my eyes, like that yeah. was the grounding element of everywhere I ever was as a kid. There yeah. was you could see. You know, from our house in the country, I could see my neighbors and my closest neighbors were three miles away. Yeah. yeah you know, it's yeah. like unless there's a tree in the way, you're you're seeing you're seeing some serious depth. Yeah. Um, so so I think that definitely played a lot into it. OK, but I'm putting a name on this thing. Is this something that you thought through or is this something that you just sort of like found yourself doing in terms of creative like growth and development? Um, as, as far as, you know, that kind of composition or right just... like in terms of like like because that is a common theme through the, I, I find in a lot of your photography is like that horizon line is super yeah. prevalent which which is probably a, a failing on my part to <laughs> to incorporate to lean so heavily on that 
so much. Well, but, but Neil Adams, you know, Neil yeah. Adams is he once said, your style is what you do wrong, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's like, that was like something I noticed as a defining feature of a lot of your photography. It's like, everything seems to have like a horizon on it and it seems to be kind of crucial and he's not messing with that too much. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is like, you know, for the, the, the cartoonist who's listening and saying like, yeah, this is all well and good, but I got to get a style so I can become marketable. Mm. Right. Is this something where you set out like you're 22 years old, you just got your camera and you're like, all right, I'm going to be the horizon guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it definitely wasn't that uh, nearly uh, uh, commercially beneficial. To me. <laughs> but I, you know, being having uh, worked as a designer and, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time incorporating text over photographs. So mm -hmm. the white space of a photograph was really crucial to whether a photograph was going to be used in a design that I was doing for an album cover or for a brochure or for a website yeah. for anything like text placement and the ability for a photograph to a, to a, allow for that was what made a photo useful or not yeah really what made it used or not so i wanted my photos used yeah. so e so even if it wasn't uh, conscious that I was like, I'm going to, you know, put my horizon at one third at the bottom every time that that was definitely an innate sort of tendency, but it became really useful as my, as I used my photos in things beyond just, here's a photo, look at the composition. Wait, it looks like all these other ones. Here's a photo, use it in a layout. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, um, that's where photography overlaps with, with comic books quite a bit because the way photography is actually used is very similar to a panel in a comic where you know type and copy is going to be an element of that. Yeah. And yeah. A, and a major element you have to accommodate for speech, you know, speech bubbles. Yeah. Yeah. And that can really determine a lot of times how much of that page or that panel is going to be, you know, illustrative versus empty for allowing the text to come in. And that is that is a number one uh, thing that I find beginning cartoonists not accommodating for is they don't leave room for sound elements yeah. or the text elements of any kind. And then they're like, oh, crap, now I don't have enough room for my dialogue. Well, yeah, you know what? Negative space, it matters. Right. 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 Um, but another thing that I, I'm, I'm hearing in everything that you're saying that I think is really cool here is you're talking about because like one of the things that they tell you in writing and in storytelling in general is brainstorming. Right. Yep. Uh, just like keeping a journal, jotting down all of your crap ideas and not thinking too hard about it. Just like let the ideas flow. And I, I I've been doing this 20 years and I still have to remind myself, put the pen on the paper and write things. And even if they're not good, ideas will start to happen through the natural act of just moving your hand and engaging your brain with the paper. And what you're doing is when you said like the, some language you used and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, you said that when you're out shooting, you're not thinking about it and you don't realize that it's bad until yeah. you look at it after the fact, right? So like when you're when you're out on the hunt, there's like an exploratory thing then. It's like mm -hmm. let's see what we can find. Is that what the, the mindset is? Yeah, often. I mean there there's there's so many different kinds of photography. You know, street yeah. street photography is nothing but um being out on the sidewalk, seeing what happens in front of you. Uh architectural photography is is you know completely different. It is a an unmoving building, you get to you know determine the angles you're going to shoot it from and stuff like that. Studio photography, you're you're building whatever it is you're going to shoot, or you're lighting whatever it is you're coaching whatever it is you're going to shoot. Um, so you know, for for my photography work, like commercial work, I I'm often having to go somewhere and determine what it is I'm going to shoot, even if, even though I then get to coach that. So. For instance, one of the things I shot for Bloomberg was a welding school in Cincinnati. It was like the biggest welding school in the in the country. I don't know what that's going to look like when I show up. I do know what their story is and what they're trying to get photos to illustrate that story to be. But I don't know what it looks like till I get there. So that practice of, you know, on my own time when I'm just doing photography for myself, it, it really is an excuse to be out and, and looking at things. When I then have to go and do it for a client, um, you know, it's that same same sort of uh, – it's more of a confined exploration of, like, what, it, what am I being presented with and what can I make work here? You know, who, who should I grab to take the photo – to get a photo of that would help illustrate the story that has already been in the works and – or what areas of this, you know, enormous building or, or the school or – or the city or any of that stuff, where, where can I pull elements from to kind of 
bring it all together on a story that I didn't write. I, you know, I didn't determine. Leading question. Uh, <laughs> that sounds confining to me. That sounds like it would be creatively restricting. I'm an artist. Let me run free. Don't give me all of these arbitrary, uh, you know, uh, prescriptive elements that I have to use in order to make art. Sure. Well, <laughs> that that would be great if I didn't have to do that ever. <laughs> but that's why I have my art, and that's why I have somebody else's. Uh, yeah. Um, but at the same time, I would have no reason to be there otherwise. So that part of it, that sort of passport into situations that I have no right otherwise to be in. If I if I just walked in there, I was like, I want to take some pictures of your welding <laughs> right, school. Right. Like, get the hell out of here. No right, way. right. But all of a sudden, I'm the guy that everyone's like, you know, trying to trying to accommodate. And like, what do you want to do? You want to bring these things in? You want to move this like 13 ton like welding torch, you know, massive propane thing over? We'll, we'll do that. And then we'll get these three people to stand wherever you want. Like, you know, they want to look good. And so I get to like direct this production. That's pretty cool. In a place that... I would never be in otherwise. Well, and also, I mean, like, it's like as somebody who does freelance uh, comic book writing, like, I get situations where it's like, okay, it's got to be this many pages, it's got to feature these characters, and it's got to have this theme, right? And uh, have it take place in this specific location, too. Yeah. And, like, you can look at that as, like, well, crap, I, what am I actually doing here? I'm not actually doing any work. I'm just, right. like, sort of assembling elements for them. But there's something kind of rewarding about, like, solving that creative problem. Yeah. You know, it's oh, like, yeah. I think like Jackie Chan, like he once said, like when he goes onto a movie set and he's like, he's trying to figure out a fight scene. He's like, okay, what can I use that's never been used in a fight? Yeah. Right? It's like, okay, there's a, there's a video game cabinet over there. There's a pinball machine over there. I could use that this way. Right. right? I'm, I'm constantly compared to Jackie Chan. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were in like a welding school. Right, that's pretty right. cool. But I, I mean, that that's another sort of element of like having been a designer for so long. Like I didn't, you know. I, I was a bit of an illustrator for a while too, but like design is assembling elements to communicate a purpose. Like that, mm. there there is no more confining art than being a graphic designer. You have probably a certain page size that's dictated by somebody else. You have words dictated by someone else. You yeah. have a certain brand dictated by someone else. You find freedom within those confines because that's that's the job. That's just that's what you're doing. And so if you if you're never going to be happy being anything but, you know, this free will and, like, I get to do whatever I want all the time, well, like, good luck. Right. But, you know, you're, you're, you're almost going to end up uh, more confined by never being put or never being exposed to things that are outside of your comfort, comfort zone or never being confronted with, I need you to tell this story th in, in a way that works for me. Mm-hmm. And you may work through that and it might be really difficult, but you might end up having some epiphanies about your own work because of it. Because otherwise, you know, if, if all I ever did was my own photography and I put it all on a horizontal scrolling thing like my website, you would see that damn horizon line <laughs> running through. I did that a couple of times. I, I put them all up on the wall as I was like sequencing something. I was like, oh, man, this is this is like I hope people think this was on purpose because I have. I have got the same line running, you know, a third of the way down this photo, like all the way down this wall. Yeah. And it looks kind of cool piece together like this, but that is not going to work for many situations. Right, right. When it, when it does work, though, I tell my students, you know, it's like take credit for it. Right, it, it right, definitely right. take well, credit. I totally meant to do it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, because that, that's part part of getting other gigs is the braggadocio. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Not, not to be a jerk about it, but yeah. to be like, like, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but but then again, I look at like your uh, your photos from Iceland, your trip to Iceland, and you were that was a, a collection where you were doing a lot of like different kinds of shots. There were the horizon shots, but there was also like we're looking down at people bathing. Mm -hmm. We're looking at uh, up at. There's one shot I remember very clearly. It's it's of uh, this really impressive waterfall with like a person in the distance, and there's oh, yeah. that juxtaposition yep. of size, like so you can get the sense of the grandiose scale, but also it's like that. It take it. I'm trying to describe the shot. So you got like the square uh, aspect ratio of the photo, but then the hills that form up to the top of the waterfall, like sort of take up the top two thirds of the image, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so there was the, the, that particular collection. You were changing a lot of shots and angles. So okay, now you, I'm. Well, there, I don't think there's a straight line in Iceland for me to <laughs> for me to shoot. So. <laughs> That's true. They don't have. It is not flat there's there, no not in the yeah. least. Uh, but 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 when I, when we talk about like architectural photography and then also like when you're talking about like doing these gigs, like how are you thinking about angles in that sense? Like because like you talk about like okay, well when you're doing like the horizon shots, 
part of it is a reaction to how will this be used. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing shots for a gig where maybe not a lot of text is going to be put on it, maybe it's just going to be put in an article, right? Or maybe just like an advertising photo where like maybe there's some text at the top and bottom, but it's not going to be like covering the thing. Uh, how are you thinking about your shots then? Like how you, like how do how do angles figure into the storytelling that you're sure. thinking about? I mean, there there is always some subject of every photo, mm-hmm. whether it's uh, you know a skyline or a person or a, you know a piece of food or something. There's always there's always some element that you want people to to focus on, okay. um, and that may play out you know, horizontally over over a wide part of the the shot, or it might. You know, be in a certain uh, corner or something. You want to lead people's eyes to it. You know, using perspective and using angles to really force people to look in this corner where to see this little thing that you wouldn't otherwise uh, notice if we were just taking a, you know, far back sort of standing uh, landscape or something. So, mm-hmm. so the use of perspective and and isolation within the composition of the frame is really important to say. This is the the thing that you should be noticing here, yeah. but at the same time, a lot, a lot of times in articles, those photos are being juxtaposed next to each other, and so making every single one of those this amazing standalone composition that goes next to this other one that's composed completely different yeah. is not going to work. Right, you know, you're, you're gonna, your eyes are going to start to uncross because <laughs> you got one leading you to this little guy over here, but then you got this other one that's that's going up and to the right and all this stuff. So yeah, so you you got to kind of. You know, and after after a while, you start to just be able to tell, like, you know, what the what the photo editor is probably going to do, and you know, you can, you you give them the photos that you think that that you really want them to use, and then you give them a bunch of crap that you know they're not going to choose, <laughs> and you can kind of see how this is going to oh come God. together. I totally do the exact same thing in freelance illustration. Oh yeah, like, you, you give them like three duds, like yep. so that they'll go in the direction that you want. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an awesome trick. Yeah. There's but, a tip for you some, watching. Yeah, you know, put some. I think there, the the common uh, term is always like a hairy arm in the corner of it. It's like, <laughs> well, all these look great, but let's get the one without the hairy arm. Yes. <laughs> That's the one that I wanted. I totally grabbed that for the tease. Harry <laughs> uh, Arm at the corner. Uh, but man, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna see what kind of emotional reaction you get to it. See if you get the same one that I do. So I go out with my family, okay. uh, my in laws, and they go, "Hey, Jersey, we're, there's an impressive thing. Go stand next to the thing. Click. Yeah. You're centered in the shot, right? And I go, "Oh, this is the worst kind of photography ever because this is just like <laughs> evidence that I was there, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not like." artful it's not interesting and then so like i take this as a serious charge to not let my students get away with that right Right. so like when they go like here's panel one characters in the center straight on shots you know because i didn't think about what this shot means right like what you're describing is what cartoonists should be doing is thinking about the relationship between all these images and i bet as somebody who thinks about this really hard you can see it in a comic when it's not being thought through definitely I mean, if you if you get through six pages of a comic and the frame has not changed very much, the composition, the the order of the people talking, or the mm-hmm. or you know the the direction of the room that we're facing, like I'm I'm getting bored quick. Yeah. You know, no matter how compelling the story is, if if you're not using the the visual storytelling along with the you know verbal or um, written storytelling. Then you're missing half the point of, of the whole thing. So if same same deal with the photos, like I I actually have lots of photos where the subject is dead center, mm-hmm. and that's actually kind of a conscious choice sometimes to say like I know that this is how everybody would have shot this thing, but that the the point here is that person and the and the surroundings really matter for. For those kind of shots. I'm thinking there's one on your website of a Captain America shirt. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's like dead center in the shot, but it's like all like damaged and it's in this pile of mud. Yeah. And like the texture and the arrangement of the shot, the, the structure right. of the stuff around it is what makes the, the, the image of this Captain America shirt. Yeah. Interesting. And, and, and that one, you know, if I had shot that in sort of a traditionally like rule of thirds sort of way where I'm like, you know, putting it off to the side, trying to make it look cool. Yeah. That's not the point. The, the point of this was that this is not cool. This is this busted old shirt sitting on the side of a cliff somewhere like in the middle of minnesota like yeah you know it's it's i'm not trying to make this look like a slick scenario yeah. this is actually like i found i found this thing that shouldn't be here and so i'm putting it right in the center to say 
does this make you feel weird that there is this thing? This is otherwise like a this beautiful national park on Lake Superior that everything should be serene and picturesque. And now there's this like faded Captain America shirt. And what's that? What's that say? Both, you know, about America because obviously it says Captain America on it. Like commercialism, all, commercialism, uh, wastefulness, wastefulness, right? and littering, and uh, you know how pretty could it be if we're going to interact with it and all that stuff. So. And it and it's a crass commercial image of what we consider to be our ideals. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and it's faded. I mean, just yeah. so so many things. Right, right. So you are thinking about clarity a lot. Yeah, when yeah. you're doing this. So like, how have you ever had situations where clarity trumps cleverness for you in your work? Like, I think that you just described that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm 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 f- almost always more drawn to. Um, Photos of of a subject, not interesting photos that happen to have a subject in them. Like, oh, God, you know, that's there's a great the, way to say it. There's a lot of there's there's amazing photographers that make incredibly slick imagery that is is perfectly applicable for what they're shooting. They're they're shooting stuff that looks great and it and it feels amazing and it and it's meant to like evoke a good feeling from you. Yeah, that's not what I'm drawn to. You know, yeah, I'm I'm not trying to make anyone feel better through my photography. <laughs> I am actually just saying. Look at what we're doing to this place. Yeah, you know, good or bad. Like, yeah, this we did this, and so most like I love landscape photography, but I get really bored with my own landscape photography if there's not something else to it besides just I was at this place that looked amazing. Yeah, and so if there's not some element of our human interaction with that environment, then it's not a great photo for me. Yeah, a lot of your a lot of your photos of environments I noticed feature some kind of quirky uh, object. Yeah, right. There'll be like a house that looks like this was once a really nice house, but it's kind of fallen into disrepair. Maybe people are still living in it, and like the address is spray painted right. on the side of the right. house. Yeah. Right. Everything else is like beautiful and pristine. Then there's this one weird thing just jutting out, saying like humanity. Right. Yep. Yep. Uh, and so the composition. Uh, you know, going back to your question about sort of composition of that stuff. I'm not I'm not trying to make a beautiful photo of this derelict looking thing. I'm I really am purposely presenting it as this is something you usually ignore. Mm-hmm. You know, you would otherwise pass this by and not think twice about it because you want to look at the pretty stuff behind it. Yeah. But this is here. So look at it. So putting that for for those reasons, putting that central when otherwise, you know, most photography books would say, you know, Put it in the corner, like put the subject in the corner. Make, you know, that's a that's a good compositional tool, mm-hmm. but it's also there's a storytelling aspect to putting something dead center. You are saying this is the thing you should be noticing. Yeah, and the stuff around it is ancillary to that. Like it's a supporting character, but this is the point of what I just shot. Well, this is completely analogous to something that cartoonists, uh, friends of mine have been saying for the last couple of years is how one of the neat things that's happened in the last 10 years in comics as web comics has come more to fruition and also as the manga generation, the gir- all the mm-hmm. girls and boys who read manga like 10, 15 years ago are now becoming adults and making comics. There's so much more variety of visual style that it almost feels like um, uh, the appealing nature of the storytelling is now separate from the uh, quality of the illustration, oh, yeah. right? We're finally at a point where you don't have to draw awesome mm-hmm. to tell good comic storytelling as long as you know how to tell a really good story. Yeah. And sometimes we can get so bewildered by fancy tricks and composition, like the rule, rule of thirds. Right. Rule is in right. there, right? Like you obey this thing. Or if you're going to break it, break it very cleverly like Picasso would, right? There's a lot of gravity put on things like that right um whereas uh sometimes the the real rule is is like are are you really trying to tell a story here yeah. or are you just trying to show everybody like your flair for exactly yeah for visuals yeah. right yeah the the slickness of things sometimes trumps the mm-hmm. point. and and there's i mean there's there's lots of great comic artists and photographers who are incredibly slick artists yeah and the stuff is like impressive as hell yeah like i wish i could you know do that sometimes uh-huh. but it's also sometimes completely boring right right yeah that's that's the weird thing like, i mean you... we're, we're barraged with imagery now mm-hmm. in our in, in our world online in book everything i mean we we live in such a lush rich imagery filled world now that like a really slick looking photo is as easily dismissed as any any as, as that derelict house so if, if you know 
it's really you really got to sort of toe the line between like am i just making the coolest looking thing or am i making this with a purpose i'm going to say like a terrible buzzword but it sounds like you're kind of talking about authenticity a little bit or yeah honesty or earnestism or earnestism <laughs> Yes, that's a conversation we've been having for a long time now. Is uh, when does irony become earnestness? Uh, Break like, through the the <laughs> ironic floor back into being earnest and becoming an earnester. I think yes, that's it. I, I, I accidentally said earnster once. I'm like, no, that's a different <laughs> thing altogether. Um, okay, well, you know what? We're coming up on the point when we should be doing book recommendations, but I want to make sure that uh, is there anything that you want to point people at uh, of of your own stuff. Like anything that you're doing, any appearances, any shows, any anything that you're doing that you want people to pay extra special attention to in the coming weeks? Um, I mean, just follow me on Instagram. Okay. That's, that's all I ever ask. Anymore. And you do shoot all those Instagram photos with your phone, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Is that Why? a rule? Who cares? I, I, I know, but like, I, I didn't realize like, until you made a joke about it on Twitter. I didn't realize <laughs> that that was like an actual thing. Like, Oh, the, yeah. People get real, real... Ain't know about that. Like, really? I mean, some some people do, some people don't. Yeah. I I mean, I I see it as just a another medium, and there's there are some photos that I it don't whatever camera I'm taking it on, they're still mostly appropriate for something like Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't see it as like somehow less than putting on my website. That's where you know most of my audience is. Like, yeah, you know, Tumblr or Instagram. That's where people are looking at. The people looking at my portfolio are photo editors that maybe are looking at it when they have a story that they need shot. Yeah. The people who are following my, you know, my story or whatever, my my work, mm -hmm. they're doing it on these places where if I if I tried to make a rule that you know, I'm only ever going to put these photo the photos from my phone up there. It's like that's that's limiting 95% of the photos that I would never put anywhere else anyway. So why right. wouldn't I put some of them up there if it is my like, you know, my output? No, well, no, yeah. I mean, like, that, that I, should you not be putting drawings on there because you didn't exactly take it. them with your? You know, that's exactly it, right? It's like, yeah, some of the photos that I post are of like I pointed them at my phone camera at my sketchbook. Yeah, but a lot of times it's stuff I drew digitally, right? right? So then I'm hosting a web comic on Instagram. Like Boulder and Fleet is yeah. on Instagram, right? So it's like yeah, that, that was the first thing I thought. I was like, well, am I breaking a rule, like an unofficial rule with this thing? Yeah, I think I think some people just they 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 like to have the rules, which is you know it's fine if, if yeah. you if you have that scenario set up and you're thriving within that awesome yeah my phone's my i still have an old iphone it's not that great like i have a much better camera I, I, that i actually like shooting with uh -huh. i want to show people those photos what what's what's your favorite camera right now um i mean actually right now uh the fuji x100t it's a it's uh it's a great little rangefinder that has completely manual um, dials for aperture shutter and and um, focus, but it's still uh, a really good digital camera. It's okay. very small. I, I have it in my bag. I take it everywhere. It's the it's the in between my phone, which is still probably what I shoot shoot everything on. So I got a kid, you know. I was like, what? yeah, a lot of photos to take. Um, <laughs> but you know, my my main camera is like a five Canon five D three with this big honking lens on it and a battery grip and all this stuff. This uh, Fuji sort of fits right in between those and takes really amazing um, raw images, but has all the sort of manual controls that I used to have. You know, I shot a, I shot a Hasselblad right up until I was shooting with the with a Canon, and I mean there was nothing automatic. There's no battery in it, so the, yeah. it was completely manual, and so I'm still very used to. Um, is that one of those like those weapons grade ones where it's like completely made of metal and it weighs like 16, 17 pounds? It's the one they took on the space shuttle. Oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, not the one. Right, but, but actually, it's the same model. Qu quick aside, yeah. I, when I was, I was living in Berkeley for a while and I sold my computer on Craigslist and the guy that bought my computer on Craigslist <laughs> was a guy who worked at the space program during the Apollo mission. He developed the uh, time code, time stamp for the film it was an attachment that went on the bottom of the Hasselblads that went up and would actually put the time on the film. It sh you know, shine yeah. a little light like point and shoots do now or oh, did for a yeah, long time. Yeah. He was one of the first ones to develop how to do that on the film in wow. the Hasselblads that the, that the astronauts use. How cool yeah. is that? Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was a crackpot otherwise, <laughs> but pretty cool for that reason. <laughs> 
a lot of people came out of the other end of the space program a little. Yeah, yeah a little yeah, weird. It, it fried some people. I think. <laughs> yeah, that some was a, bur- some serious burnout. Yeah, there was a, a very intense period. So, um, okay, cool. Well, if we'll follow you on Instagram, Peter Baker on Instagram. Uh, yeah, I agree. The, the, the posting natively on social media is like the only like that's the blog now, right? Yeah, I mean it's all arbitrary. Like you know, if 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 it wasn't for the fact that Instagram was on a phone that had a camera, mm-hmm. nobody would even think twice about it. It's like. I, what am I going to post to Tumblr then? Only stuff that I made on my computer, you know. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, I don't know. yeah. I don't. I don't have time for all these rules. People like to make lots of rules, but uh, but you also brought books that you're reading right now. So, yeah. like, I would be curious to see what a professional photographer and designer is reading. What what is he responding to? Well, the mm. the first one is is a photography book. I just okay, wanted cool. to bring this because um, Alex Soth is you know probably my my biggest photography influence. Uh, this was the guy I mentioned earlier that shoots. Um, amazing, you know, poetic landscapes and portraits with an enormous camera that takes, you know, half hour, 45 minutes to, like, set up, get the photos. So so by the time he's taken the photo, his subject, whoever he is convinced to hang out for that long, is in such a relaxed state of, state of mind that they are, the photos that he's capturing of them are as true to a, a realistic, authentic um, yeah. scenario as you're going to find. So... Um, this is sort of his compendium, Alex Oath, From Here to There. Very cool book. Um, Sleeping by the Mississippi was the book that sort of blew him up. He's he's one of the photographers who really was at the, the beginning of the book resurgence in photography. So he, you know, he, he does make enormous framed gallery prints and has amazing exhibitions, but his um, artistic output is primarily through books. Mm. And, and he has a very very uh purposeful thread throughout his stories oh cool yeah very cool um then uh i just started reason reading WYSIWYG, mm. which is partly um for my other job <laughs> as a uh creative director at a at a internet security company hacking culture is a very big deal to us so this is sort of a, a combination of five real stories about actually true life hackers who, you know, Kevin Mitnick is part of the element of this guy, but um, the one guy, the serial hacker in this book is sort of um, a conglomerate of a, of a few different true stories and mm. very, very cool. Um, really nice, simple uh, sort of Chris Ware style illustration. Yeah. I was say like, he's like somewhere between Daniel Klaus and Chris Ware. Yeah. Right. A um, little more, a little more illustrative than, or a little more detailed than, than Chris Ware, but yeah, cool stuff. Yeah, and this is from Top Shelf, WYSIWYG, or WYSIWYG. And portrait it's, of a you know, Mac SE cover, which is just yeah, that's pretty kinda, great. Kinda red. <laughs> that, yeah. that is pretty good design. I mean, this is that thing, like, this tells you what to expect. Yep. Ter- yep, right? That's a great cover. And then plus with, like, the old-timey, like, 1996 Photoshop. Mac Paint. Oh, is that Mac Paint? Yeah. Oh, my God, it's been so long since I've seen it. Oh, and then you got like some more traditional stuff here. Yeah, so so Letter Forty Four was a really cool one that I read recently. Um, you know, I I I don't keep up enough on sort of monthly um, releases. So mm-hmm. often I'm going to Vault to Midnight and talking to Curtis or Christian. And they're like, "What do I got to read right now?" Mm-hmm. And Christian uh, there recommended this. Yeah, you know, they're they're really great about sort of like what do you what are you into? And and one of the things that I've always loved in comic books is the the what ifs or the else worlds yeah. it's sort of like we have a story but this is a completely different take on this thing that you are you know because i can't keep up with the avengers you know ongoing 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 stories mm-hmm. but i love this sort of mini series of like well what if it wasn't like that you know what if what if silver surfer got the infinity gauntlet or something like that yeah um so letter 44 is a really cool um Cool book. It is an ongoing one, but I just got the the first volume of it. It was uh, the story of the president, modern day president, who took over for a sort of George Bush type, and you know railed against all the the policies of going to war and stuff. There was an Iraq and Afghanistan war, but then when he got into office, there's this letter waiting on the oval on the Oval Office desk, telling him that the Iraq and Afghanistan wars were a a cover up for spending money on the space program to, because they found aliens near Jupiter. And so everything that he had been railing against, now he has to keep going to. So it's uh, sort of this great like story of uh, you know, sort of true socio political dynamics of things while also having this 
uh, three-year space program to go out and just see what's going on by Jupiter. So, so the story is both about the president trying to keep this thing going and tell everybody why he's not doing what he said he was going to do for so long uh-huh. and the uh, deep space mission that's going out to see it. So, mm. Very cool. Um, very cool. Well, and it just sounds like just the thing to like kind of raise your uh, goose flesh considering the whole series thing that's going on right now. The planet series, C E R E S, like with the two weird lights on it. Yep. We still don't know what that is, right? right? Maybe, but maybe we do. <laughs> um, and the other one, I mean, the other book I brought, if, if, if anybody hasn't already read this a dozen There's times, a lot of people who crazy. haven't read it, but the Infinity Gauntlet is still. By far my favorite series. It, you know, it's only six issues. The the rest of them, Infinity War, Infinity uh, Crusade, the, those kind of fell off a bit. But Infinity Gauntlet was, I mean, part of it was just when this was coming out. This was like my prime comic reading time, and it was just like the the mix of like cosmic Marvel with this sort of you know getting into the concepts of being able to control reality and the soul and, and time. and I mean, it was just, I soaked it up. It was, like, it was George Perez too, wasn't it? George Perez, Ron Lim took over after the fourth issue. That's right. I mean, his, he did all the covers for, for all six. George Perez did the artwork and then Ron Lim. I mean, both those guys, they were the, like when I was copying comics, those were yeah. the ones I was copying. Oh yeah. And this is, this is actually a great example of uh, composition and stuff. There are so many, so many pages in here where big pullbacks to to large scale space stuff. I mean, this was this was cosmic marvel at its best. Like yeah. th- this blew my mind. Being there's one <laughs> there's just one spread in here where it pulls back and you see all the um, the Eternals and the and chaos. Oh, I mean, chaos and order, like personifying chaos and order as these yeah. two like the dichotomy of that stuff. Love and hate were people. Yeah, I mean yeah. that that I was like in eighth grade or something when this came out. I mean, it was like trying mushrooms for the first time. So I was like, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. These are these are people that I can talk to. No way. And you well know, and death is like yeah, Thanos is like his, his his crush. Yeah. Yeah. It was unreal. So yeah, yeah. And the thing about Perez's work, I mean like and I I just I just had a former student of mine come to town and she was like, uh I, I need to go to the vault. Because you 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 schooled me in a lot of things, but you never schooled me in what I, what my history is, right? Like who are, yeah. who are the the artists who I need to know of to know my people's history? And uh, I'm like, okay, well, you know, Kirby, Michelle yep. Kirby. And she's like, nah. like yeah. all right, you're not old enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> like Kirby's like beer. Like when you first have it, you're like, this is gross. Why would anybody drink this? <laughs> and then like you get to be like a little bit older, you're like, hey, yeah. this is amazing. Where's this been all my life? Uh, but the, the next one, I was like, I was like, you need to read Perez. Yeah. You need to read Perez's Infinite Gauntlet, Crisis on Infinite Earths, and then also, have you read JLA versus Avengers? No, no, I should. It, if, if anything, George Perez, I, I will. I'll, I'll take. It's it's all of that, but it's also because like all the like Cosmic Marvels in it. Yeah, but it's this. You say it wrote it, and he does this wonderful analysis of how the two universes feel through the eyes of the person from the other universe. Yeah. So Superman goes to the Marvel U, and he's like. How come these heroes can't hold their stuff together? All their people hate them. All of the citizens hate their heroes. This is stupid. You guys don't know. You can clean up your mess, right? right. And then Captain America comes to the DCU and he's like, the, they, "Those heroes have statues made to them. They're clearly tyrants. Uh, they're, they're they've got their people uh, terrified yeah. of them, uh, right?" And so like you get it's like like uh, Quicksilver goes to the to the uh, DCU and he's like, "In Central City, the people love the Flash, you know, and like I'm a mutant and people chase me around with you know stakes and knives." Yeah. Uh, so it, it has that plus all of the cosmic stuff and it. right. it's pretty good. And and I'll I'll say it. I was I was after. Um... You know, after the Avengers movie came out and Thanos showed up at the end, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, man, <laughs> I remember I was there. I was free, like, I was, I was, it was like coffee the next week. You're like, did you see? Yeah, and so, great. so I picked up a bunch of Avengers books from like the year prior and stuff. And, yeah. and the new Avengers is um, almost all. I mean, it's like hyper cosmic. It's like um, you know, going back to these the architects of the universe and stuff like that. But but the way. You know, going back to the composition and storytelling and stuff, like it's really confusing what they're talking about. They do not I mean they're they're using terms that I don't know if I just missed that issue, yeah. but the way they're talking about this stuff is like this is it's not scientific, so it's not like it's not like it's heady, right. but it's just really obtuse and the way they, they lay it out, it's just maybe there's too many things going on. That's what I love about the Infinity Gauntlet, is like it it's so clear yeah. what's happening page by page, even though you're talking about concepts like Having a gem that can control reality and having time, you know, 
collapse and 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 layer itself and like bend back. I mean, like enormously complicated aspects uh, or concepts of things, right. but it's so clear and it's accessible. Laid out so well, it's super accessible, right? Yeah, I mean, like that was a rule back then: is that every comic is somebody's first. So we have to make this that the entry the the cost of entry is really low, yeah. and it feels like, especially in the last fifteen years, comics has got direct market. Comic store comics monthlies have gotten less so, yeah, right? Like yeah. the, the price of entry is a little bit higher. Um, I don't know if they just expect that you are reading them all, or because they have so many versions of the Avenger or versions of every team. That's a whole other discussion, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's telling that, and I, and I actually applaud DC for this, but it's telling that they released a book explaining all of their core graphic novels that are like the must read. Here are like the 12 mm. most important graphic novels we've done, and these are the entry points in the DCU. The fact that they have to give you you know, a triple A triptych yeah. in order to like navigate their stories is yeah. a telling thing. <laughs> right. right. So true. <laughs> did I just date myself by talking about triptychs? <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I want to respect your time, Pete. Uh, but man, I'm so glad we finally did this. Yeah, this was great. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, cool. So um Peterbaker.net, P T R B K R on yeah, Twitter. Yeah. I got on Twitter when it was cool to take all the vowels out of stuff. <laughs> I got out there early enough Still to get says my it first though. name. Peter Baker. But I'm the douchiest of all, though, because I got just my first name yeah. on Twitter. That's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, how many other jerseys? There's actually quite a few, believe it or not. But you know about the base thing. Right? Yeah. 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 So, like, he's got jersey droves. So, some people accidentally tag him all the right. time. That's right. Stuff. That's right. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so people should follow you up on Instagram, Peter Baker on Instagram. Uh, and this show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG109. If you enjoyed this discussion, if you got something out of this, if you at least had fun, a great thing you could do is go to iTunes, give it a star review. You don't have to write a review, just however many stars you think that this episode deserves. Uh, if you're watching it on YouTube, give it a thumbs up. That helps more people find the show. And the more people who find the show, follow the show, the more uh, I can lean on the library to let me do more interesting things with the show. Speaking of the library, thank you to Eric Kloster and Matt Dubay in the control room for putting this show on, for uh, giving me the space to do this, and wiring all the octopus tentacles into the big machine to let me do this thing. Thank you for downloading, listening, and watching. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs>